Uh, hello everyone, my name is Karim Khairat and I'm the GNN in Science stream, stream owner here at ACE. Uh, ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering and products. We host three live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. To, to see more, please visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Explain, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. We currently have more than 30 different streams that are focused on various ML topics. And this session is in the GNN stream. Hope you enjoyed and come back. Today, I'm very excited to host uh, Tobias Pfaff, uh, who will be presenting his work on learning mesh-based simulation with graph networks. So Tobias is a research scientist at DeepMind. Prior to that, he was a physics simulations lead at Avametrics. He holds a PhD in computer science from ET at Zurich and has conducted postdoctoral research at UC Berkeley, where he worked on adaptive remeshing, thin shell simulation, and fracture, fracture simulation for computer graphics. So without further ado, I will let him start his presentation. Thanks, Karim. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, um, today I will uh, talk to you a little bit about our uh, newest work, which is uh, learning mesh-based simulation. And that's uh, a paper that we submitted to iClear and just got accepted. And this is a joint work with my wonderful colleagues, Mary Fortunato, Alvaro Sanchez, and Peter Battaglia. And we are all at DeepMind. So okay, what is this about? So this is fundamentally a paper about uh, learning physical dynamics on mesh representations, right? And so why do we specifically care about meshes? Well, so for a lot of problems in engineering sciences, meshes are often the best way to represent and discretize surfaces and volumes. And if you look at the pictures over there, it would be very inefficient, for example, to represent the systems uh, as a voxel grid or something, right? So um, if you, for example, like the, look at the bridge, um, you have to express deformations and stuff like that is very uh, awkward to express on uh, grids or particles, say. On unmeshes, we also have very powerful methods for integrating or solving PDEs, uh, computing deformations and all of that. And this is why they are uh, pretty much like the number one tool in, for a lot of applications and particularly in engineering. So the other thing about meshes that we find very interesting is that they enable resolution adaptivity. That means we can kind of decide where we want to optimally spend our computation or resource budget budgets. So we can use uh, smaller cells and regions of the simulation where there will be steeper gradient gradients. And in other regions, we can use larger cells. So on the slide here, you see uh, two examples of that. And both of those are domains that we actually like run uh, our method on. So these are results. 
So on the top, we have an aerodynamic simulation, um, which is just like the flow around the cross section of an air foil there. And this entire domain, this circle you see on the left, is 40 meters wide. But around the wingtip, we have an accuracy of 0 0.2 millimeters. And this whole mesh has 5,000 nodes. Um, if you would to represent like the same thing with a uniform grid, for the same precision, you would need 40 billion nodes. And then on the bottom one, we have uh, like an example of a cloth simulation trading over a sphere. Um, and this is a fixed budget of 1,000 nodes. And you can kind of see that uh, we achieve much more precise, precise solutions when we use an adaptive mesh rather than a regular spaced one. But uh, despite all of these advantages of using meshes in machine learning research, particularly on predicting physical systems, uh, most methods actually are using grids, right? So there's a, a lot of work on predicting like uh, airfoil or like fluid simulations, um, all on grids. Um, there is a bit of work on using particles, for example, also our latest paper there, which we submitted at last year's ICML. But um, in generally, uh, the whole field is pretty much dominated by CNN-based architectures, which, I mean, of course, is partially explained by the popularity and um, you know, strengths of things like ResNets and unit architectures, um, which perform really well in these domains. But the other thing to note here is that um, the domains that are studied are generally the ones which can actually easily be expressed on grids. So very few papers even attempt to solve problems on complex 3D domains like the bottom ones. Right? And so for us, um, the natural question is then, like, can we actually leverage meshes to perform like, physics predictions on non-trivial complex domains and reap all the benefits that uh, mesh-based representations can bring to classical simulation? And so, as you can probably guess by the title of this talk, the answer we found to be yes. Um, and using meshes, we are able to simulate complex scenes uh, on a lot of domains from class to fluid simulation. And we show that they have very desirable properties too. We uh, show stable and accurate rollouts with strong generalization results, being 10 to 100 times faster than their ground truth simulators. And on the bottom, you see some example model rollouts just to get an idea of what we're doing here. Uh, we will look uh, in detail at those results later. All right, um, so let's take a bit of a closer look on how we actually do this. So if you, uh, by chance, have seen our previous work on uh, learning uh, the physical dynamics of particle systems, you already have a good idea how that works. But since we're building on this model, I will summarize uh, the idea here to go on the same page. So basically, what we would want to do is learn a forward model. That is a model that takes the current system state and returns the next system state, like a step of a classical simulator. And then once you have trained this at test time, you can just apply the model over and over in a loop and get a trajectory or a model rollout. And so the core model here, uh, in both in the old and the new method, is a graph network, specifically a encode process decode architecture. That's the thing that takes us from step T to T plus one. And the way it works is like this. So we have an encoder, um, which is a network which transforms the input state into a graph. And here, since the system is made of water particles, we turn particles into graph nodes. And then we, contain, uh, we connect neighboring particles together with edges within a fixed connectivity radius. The encoder then embeds all of these features independently for every node and every edge in this, um, in this graph into feature vectors. And these feature vectors are stored on the graph nodes and graph edges. So now we have a graph which we then can use in a, in a graph net to produce further. So this is what the processor does. It performs several rounds of message passing. So in each of these rounds, uh, each of node in the graph computes a message, which each of its neighbors, and then pools all of the incoming messages from the edges to update the node information. And as a result, the node and edge embeddings are updated at each step using local information of the neighborhood. And this is pretty standard graph net stuff. Basically, it's still the same idea as the classical 2016 Interaction Networks paper, except we don't use one, but many of these graph net blocks chained with residual connections. So at, at each of these graph net blocks, we kind of do one step of message passing, and we, we do generally from 5 to 20 of those in our simulations. 
And then finally, the decoder uses the updated representations at each node to decode particle accelerations, which are then given to an Euler integrator to produce the next state. Or you could just predict the absolute position at the next time step, and you don't even need like an integrator. And this model worked really uh, well for us for simulation of fluids and granular materials. But uh, it didn't work for a lot of other things like elastics. And this is kind of the stuff we want to look at for our new method now. So our new model extends this framework to work with meshes. As you can observe, it follows the previous encode process decode framework, uh, but there are some key differences. So the most obvious difference is that now the input state is no longer a set, but a mesh, which is already a graph, right? So um, the difference is that the mesh edges alone may not be optimal for message passing anymore. And here's actually an example why. Let's see. So in this plot, we see uh, like a cloth simulation. So on the left, we have the, the cloth dynamics in, in 3D. And on the right, we have the mesh space, which is kind of like an underformed, flattened out view of the corresponding cloth mesh. And this space, uh, this mesh space makes it very easy to compute things like internal dynamics, such as deformation gradients, which are building blocks of the elasticity PDEs we're solving. But if you think about external dynamics like collision and contact, this is problematic, right? So for example, the points I and J that are highlighted here are quite close in 3D world space and could potentially form a self-collision. So we would need to pass messages between them to detect and resolve collisions. But as you can see, they are quite far away in mesh space and having them communicate via mesh edges could be very inefficient. And similarly, the mesh corresponding to the sphere obstacle on the left is not even connected to the cloth mesh. So it's impossible for the graph net to model the interaction between the two, since these graphs are disjoint. So instead, what we do is we give our model capabilities to reason both in world space and mesh space. So specifically, our model encodes both world space and mesh space coordinates and adds additional world space edges based on spatial proximity in a similar way as we did for the particle systems before. So these are the uh, orange lines in this plot here, while the blue lines are the mesh edges. Once we have that, the model kind of does the same as before, except we do message pathing in both spaces, right? So the mesh model separately pools world space and mesh space messages for each node during message pathing. And this then allows us to both compute internal dynamics, such as the elasticity, as well as external dynamics, such as collision uh, accurately. And then finally, our decoder extracts acceleration for each particle of the mesh, which is then used to update the state, again, with an oil integrator. And by using noise during draining, we can train this model on one-step data and then have it generalized to rollouts of hundreds of steps at a test time. And crucially, in this work, we also use relative positional features to make the model fully local and translation equivalent. And that's something I will talk a little bit uh, later towards the end of the talk. And finally, on the modeling part, I have mentioned earlier that meshes are great because they can adapt their resolution according to scale and complexity of the dynamics in different regions. But of course, the regions we want higher resolution in that can change during the course of simulation, like the folds on this flag, which moves over time. So what we want is a way to adapt the mesh so it does stay optimal during the whole simulation rollout. And what classical simulators do here is they use adaptive remeshing to do this. And this is typically a two-step process. Right? So first, what we do is uh, we decide what target mesh resolution we want at different points. Right? And the one metric we adopt in this paper is called a sizing field, which is just basically something that a tensor that encodes optimal edge lengths everywhere in the mesh. And we should note that determining this optimal resolution isn't easy. And it also really depends on the system we simulate. Um, maybe we want like higher resolution at the folds uh, to prevent like uh, these uh, like kind of sharp uh, edge angles here, or where velocities are very high. Or if we think about things like fluid, we want like very small triangles in boundary layers to get like boundary layer effects correctly. And there's 
it's kind of hard to have like a general expression that like captures all of that. And this, what most simulators really do is they have a, a bunch of heuristics that just like work well and give you in the end very good simulation accuracy. But in order to implement that, you kind of do need a lot of domain knowledge, right? And so, but once you have this uh, sizing field or any other form of kind of information where you want your resolution, what you can then do is you can uh, use a remeasure and that is generally something that's domain independent, right? So it's really just um, a process that takes in like the field of optimal resolution and adapts the mesh so that resolution criterions are met. And so what we could do is we could use such an adaptive remesher in our model just during rollout and then keep just adapting the mesh as it goes along. But in order to do so, we might need to code up or like link to these uh, domain specific remeshing heuristics to build up the sizing field during rollout. And because these are domain specific, this kind of defeats the purpose of learning a simulator in the first place. So what we do instead is we learn this. Um, so we can train kind of an identical copy of our model. And instead of uh, producing things like particle accelerations, uh, it outputs the sizing field at each node. And then once we have the sizing field, we can then again, just use a generic remesher to um, kind of imitate the sizing field of the ground truth simulator uh, to, yeah, and, and satisfy the, the sizing field constraints. And currently we only do that in the imitation setting. So what that means is like our data that we feed into our uh, learned model kind of already has uh, certain distributions and has small triangles where we want them. And our model kind of learns these distributions, right? But something that uh, we're very interested in doing in future work is uh, instead of this, um, learn end to end the optimal resolution for a downstream task, right? And this way we could actually even get meshes that are better than like the, the meshes that our crown true simulator we train on feeds us. But currently in this paper, we only really just like learn from the data we are given. All right, so this is kind of like the, the core of our uh, model, right? And um, I think now we can look at what we can actually do with such a model. So the first thing I want to mention there is that like one nice advantage of uh, our model is that it is very versatile. So um, in the previous work, we what we did, we kind of used the model to predict the acceleration of discrete particles. And in fact, we can still do that uh, as our model is a generalization of GNS, the, the old method. But now we can also do other things. We can predict arbitrary continuous quantities sampled on meshes. And to simulate all of these very different systems, uh, be that Eulerian systems, um, Lagrangian systems, tetrahedral, triangular, whatever simulations, um, you can use the exactly the same model. The only difference is what quantities we encode in the input step and how we interpret the per node output of the model. And that doesn't have to be things like acceleration, as I showed you in the class dynamics example. There can also be other quantities. Um, and I want to, yeah, just like show you some of our results and then you can get an idea like how that would look like. So I have a quick question. Um, sure. Um, regarding, let's say, structural mechanics, right? Yes. Uh, how does the elasticity of the material enter um, into your graph neural network? Yes, I mean, we don't do anything explicit to account for the fact that this is like an, an elasticity model, right? So what we're modeling is really just based on positions. So we have, uh, you can kind of see this, the structure mechanics example here, and I will show a video of this later. Mm -hmm. And really we just model the these nodes moving. Um, so um, the model doesn't necessarily care about like what kind of simulation it is, right? It just says like, okay, at this, we get these input positions, and this mm -hmm. was the input positions of the previous step. And then the output is like, how do they move, right? Right. So, so the model has already learned. Let's say if two of these uh, positions uh, nodes on the mesh get too close together, that that's not possible, or there's there's a resistance, there's repulsion. Exactly. Yes. Okay. I see. So, if you were to generalize this, for example, for a material with another elasticity or a fluid with another viscosity, you would have. You, can you can you let's say learn on a fluid with one viscosity and then simulate on a fluid with having another viscosity or in the current framework how does that how, yeah. how does one go about that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. I mean, this is not an 
specifically something we tested for. We did similar things, right? But like there's basically two ways you can do this. Like one way to learn the behavior of a material is really just like baking it into the weights. So this is what we did here, right? So we had like kind of one type of material. The material didn't change in this. And then you just like learn implicitly from your data what the material is, right? right. The other way you can also do that is you can in your training set have a range of materials, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you also then feed in material parameters. Um, so to tell it like this is a, I don't know, say like you have your Young's modulus or whatever, right? This is like an additional input parameter that we provide you. And then like test time, you can kind of say like, oh, now we have a material with this Young's modulus. Right. And then we get the behavior of this material, right? I see. And you can even, you don't necessarily have to like even condition on these real physical parameters. So in this previous paper on particle physics, what we did is like, we had just like a bunch of different particle types, right? And the model learned that these are different materials. Like one was sand, one was like a, a liquid. Mm -hmm. And you can also have uh, continuous parameters, whatever. So the model doesn't then need to know this. There's no really like importance of that being like the Young's modulus. It's just like whatever you want to give it to distinguish these are different materials. And once you do this, you can um, yeah, you can attest time like query for these specific materials. I see. Yeah. Th thanks. Yeah. And I have an example. I don't actually think in these slides I have a video for that, but I, I can talk talk through you what would we did in this sphere uh, in this yeah. space. <laughs> All right. OK, um, so yeah, let's look at some um, result videos here. So this here is a 2D incompressible flow around a cylinder. So this is a model that we train on data from COMSOL, which is like an engineering F, uh, FEM simulator. And the graph nodes here are just samples of the continuous velocity and pressure fields. And so the output uh, what we get per node represents the temporal change in those fields. So this is what we model, right? And again, there's no really any importance the fact that these are velocity and pressure fields, we just like the network takes them in and predicts the output of that. So in, in any case, like I'm not sure how well these videos come across uh, through the stream. If they don't come across very well, I put the uh, address to our video site in the bottom, and I'll also have then the last slide. So you can look at like this and all the other videos we have uh, for all paper and like high quality. All right, so this is like a yeah, one uh, Eulerian um, fluid prediction example. Uh, here we have another one. This is a uh, now compressible flow around the cross section of an airfoil. This is uh, this is an example I started with on uh, the adaptive meshing. You can kind of see like here we have on the wing tip a very small resolution. For, this is from the SU2 simulator or something like some people using in aerodynamics. And again, like what we're doing here is that uh, we are sampling uh, the velocity uh, and pressure. And here we also have a density field and the mesh nodes and we predict the change in those fields. So, so what I find interesting is that in, you know the model is able to capture long range uh, effects. Like in, I don't know if this is incompressible or not, but in the previous this is a compressible on the previous this is compressible, compressible. right? But in the previous slide, you showed uh, flow around the cylinder in incompressible fluid, and that basically, if you were to solve that the normal way, you you need a pressure solver, and that's a global yes. solver, and and uh, I'm, I'm guessing from, from what you showed is that you don't have enough message passing uh, steps to cover the entire domain. So I'm really curious to know, like, why is it, why are the simulations still looking so realistic? Yeah, this is actually a good point, right? So like, th this is one of the key assumptions we actually make uh, is that like the dynamics we learn are mostly local, right? So. We in these examples we use I think 15 message passing steps. So this is kind of like information can propagate 15 kind of like node hops during like one step of uh, of a model rollout. Yeah, and as you say, I mean most of the dynamics that we learn here are local, um, but some are not. Right, uh, pressure for example can like travel really fast. This is why you generally have these kind of global solvers there. We don't do this, right? So the method uh, our model learns to compensate for that. And there's clearly limits to what you can do. And uh, I also don't have the video here, but I mean, there is edge cases and we actually see this breaking down a little bit, right? Um, but in the, in the case of um, compressible flow, you can kind of see how it works, right? You can kind of think about our model learning to do something like an iterative solver, right? So it doesn't necessarily so perfectly like remove um, compressive, like the uh, like density fluctuations everywhere, right? But it kind of like locally uh, spreads them out, and then over several time steps, it kind of like tries to converge to a solution, which might not always be perfect. But uh, on average, we don't actually see like huge sources and sinks being created because it kind of learns uh, from the data that that I mean 
there shouldn't be any of those, right? Right. Um, but again, as I said, like there, if, if you have scenes, uh, things like hard limits, and I can actually maybe I switch to the next example where we see that. Oh, no, I, I, in two slides, I will come back to this plan. Sure. <laughs> Right. So again, he, uh, here for something a bit different, here we have clause simulation. So that's like the um, cross dynamics of a moving dynamic mesh. And again, here the inputs and outputs are 3D positions and uh, accelerations. And you can already see this mesh is actually changing. So this uses the adaptive remeshing that I um, introduced earlier. And then finally, uh, we have um, a structural mechanics example. And here you can actually see like that the mesh doesn't have to be a triangle mesh. This is a volumetric tetrahedral mesh. And um, the method doesn't actually care what kind of mesh you use, right? Because since the only thing we have in the mesh are like nodes uh, which are connected by edges, just will just learn it the same way it did before. Um, and the other thing to note about this example is this is a quasi-static simulation, not an inertial simulation as the previous ones, right? And from the modeling perspective, it doesn't really make any difference. You just encode positions and decode position change, and that's really it, right? But like in a quasi-static simulation, you kind of have instantaneous reactions everywhere in the mesh, right? And here, the method can kind of cope uh, pretty OK with this, right? But if you make this mesh, for example, very, very long, right? There's no way, um, actually, it, within one step, the information from like this collider can propagate all the way to the side as it would need to, right? So there's, then you can kind of see like these little artifacts accumulating, right? And this is actually one of the things like I think um, like needs to be a little bit of like a, a rethink if you want to like apply this type of method to kind of more quasi-static simulations, other things that have like really fast or long range interactions, um, how you can actually prevent this. And maybe, yeah, we can come back to, at the conclusion to this kind of point. All right. Um, where was I? Okay. So yeah, so these are like a little bit, uh, a few different domains, which I mean, are very different physics in a way, right? They're like have different PDEs, but the core model architecture that we use for all of these examples is exactly the same, right? In many cases, we even use the exact same hyperparameters, right? So there's uh, training noise is one thing we need to tweak a little bit, but everything else, I mean, it's, it's the same, right? Uh, you, you don't need to tweak like the layer depth or like latent sizes or whatever. The model can generally like operate well on a wide range of these settings. So there's a question from the audience about how different are is the ground truth from the training data? Basically, has the ground truth been seen already in the training set? OK, so yeah, so these are um, like, we have a classic train test set split. And what you're seeing here in this prediction, this is the test set, right? So this exact configuration has not um, been seen in training. However, right. it is. For these examples here, this is the same distribution, right? So you can kind of see like what the difference is. So like here, for example, the both training and test sets are like these plates with like randomized holes in it. Like this uh, collider changes the they changes the, like the the size a bit. Also like the thickness of the material changes. And there's similar things in the previous examples, right? For like the cylinder flow, like the input speed changes and whatever. And so like this is kind of like a little bit an easy interpolation test. Mm -hmm. And our model does really really well on this. And later, um, I will also show you generalization settings. So where we try our model on something very, very different from our um, training distributions. Okay. And yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to that, like just yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sets now. OK, um, first, though, uh, we can look a little bit at um, adaptive remeshing, right? So I've already shown you one example of the cloth, which has this adaptive remeshing. And here, you can also see this learned sizing field. So this is kind of like, you can kind of see the, the yellow regions where like the allocating like finer uh, resolution. Um, you see. So, and you can kind of see like as these uh, folds and bends propagate to the class, the sizing field does adapt and give more resolution to these areas. And here we have a comparison. So on the left, we have the crown truth. Uh, in the middle, we have the learned dynamics, but crown truth uh, meshing. And on the right, we have learned everything. And you see, like, all of those look very plausible, right? And it's like, this is a chaotic system, so the exact movement of the cloth will always be slightly different. But all of these options kind of give you plausible uh, plausible dynamics. And uh, also, if you look at, like, MSE over um, some local window, they are actually pretty good. Um, and yeah, in the paper, we 
do, do have a, a bunch of like baseline comparisons more like in a, in, in a quantitative setting uh, to other methods like mesh-free methods, grid-based methods, and other graph architectures. And here on the right, you can kind of see like you, our method is actually pretty accurate and beats these baselines in accuracy. But I think it's probably more interesting to see like why that is. So I'm gonna like look, um, give you two examples and we look in a little bit detail like where these uh, differences in, uh, in quantitative and qualitative performance come from. So first we have a comparison to mesh-free methods. So this is uh, this is gene S, which is pure message passing in world space. Um, so on this flag example, what we kind of see is that despite us using all these kind of tricks that we always use, so like we use training noise, et cetera, et cetera, the world does become unstable really quickly. And in this error plot on the right, you see it actually, I mean, is when it's unbounded and just goes through the roof. And while our methods does remain stable. And the reason for that is that uh, gene S can't properly evaluate deformation. It does not have any sense of like what kind of like the rest rest state of, of the mesh is because it does lack the mesh space information. And so it can't evaluate like deformation gradients on all of these uh, components very well that like are building blocks to compute uh, like elasticity, hyper elasticity, what you need to resolve this. And the second example here is on grid-based methods. And so the first thing to note is that um, for many of our domains uh, like structural mechanics or the cloth, these are things you can't even easily solve on a grid, right? Uh, these 2D flow domains, like the incompressible and compressible flow, um, are actually best case scenarios for CNN style predictions, right? But even here, we do perform better. And the reason for that comes down to adaptivity. And if you look in the right, this is a simulation domain for our method again. Um, so what we could do and what a lot of papers do is we just like take a region around the, the airfoil and then just like sample it with a grid, say like 128 by 128. And then you do predictions on that with the UNET, right? This is especially in this space is what kind of almost everyone does. And but like while these UNET predictions uh, do look plausible on the first glance, they completely undersample the important region, the wing tip region, even while using 5x more cells than our mesh. Um, and even because of that, we actually get, especially in these uh, important regions, and much lower error rates. So even in these flat domains, um, it can make sense to use mesh representations. All right, now we uh, go to um, come to generalization. So because of a combination of the relative encoding and training on different sized triangles, we do get actually very strong re generalization results. So here's like a mild generalization example. We take the model trained on this rectangular flag you've seen before, and we apply it to a different shape. It's still a flag, but it's like kind of these weird fish shaped flags. Um, and we get kind of pretty good um, performance on those. Um, and the one thing to note here is like, I mean, A, the mesh is different as you can see here, but also this is a generalization test both for the learned dynamics and for the learned remeshing model. So the, the remesher also like learns to like figure out like where the triangles need to be uh, smaller, even in this kind of unseen region. But we can also generalize to much more complex setups. So here we have this uh, Windsock with tassels kind of thing. And our model has no trouble generalizing to this, like to a cylinder shape, even though it's only ever seen a rectangular flag in training. And the other thing to note here is that the mesh is also much bigger than the training mesh. It has uh, 10 times as many nodes. You kind of see all these like tiny little triangles here. And so here we have uh, the training domain for comparison below. It's like both in complexity, uh, also in dynamics, this is very, very different, right? And um, so, so we can actually apply this like wide outside of our uh, the range we training on. And the training domain is really just variations of this flag, so like different angles and stuff like that. Um, and the other thing to notice is that um, that because like uh, our, our generalization setups can be like much larger, um, together with the fact that we are faster, that allows us to um, at training time train on cheap lowest data and then at test time scaling things up. So we don't actually need a lot of like very expensive ground truth simulations necessarily to train a model that actually performs well on like large scale sense. And then finally, um, I wanna mention a few key ingredients that we did find necessary or useful to make these models work. And this is not necessarily specific to uh, meshes. This is, I mean, most of these examples are in fact from our old paper, but the findings are often quite the same. 
so the first thing is stability. So one insight is that no matter how good your model is, there will always be error on your predictions. And this is something that accumulates in rollouts. So what you need to make sure is that the model has actually um, seen inputs that are corrupted by noise. Otherwise, it will just explode um, during model rollout. And this is some example you can see before that we borrowed from a different paper. Um, and what we do that with training noise, um, which works exceedingly well. We can get like, I mean, basically unconditionally stable simulations. So here's like on the bottom is a simulation of this um, this flag again. We just run it for like very long, for like, I don't know, tens of thousands of steps or something. And just, I mean, you can kind of see it's like sped up a lot. So this, I mean, it just keeps on being stable, right? Um, and so this is something we use for pretty much anything we do in the realm of uh, physics prediction, uh, applying a bit of training noise is really the, yeah, the thing that keeps stuff stable. Another thing that we found very important is to limit the amount of information that is fed into the network. And this might seem a little bit counterintuitive uh, because you might think like that giving the network access to a lot of information about the system, it can pick up all these like patterns and produce more accurate predictions. And that's actually the thing that beats like classical simulations, right? And that is, of course, the case. But um, the other thing that happens if you do that is that you're much more likely to overfit um, to your training set. And then you can't actually do these kind of strong generalization tests that we did before. So, I mean, here's a trivial example. Instead of uh, providing like the position of each particle as an input feature, we only provide relative particle-particle distances. And that's something that we, that we store on the edges between particles here, right? And this way, then at test time, you can apply the model to a larger system without the network struggling to deal with coordinates that are much larger than it's seen in training, right? This is the only reason we can actually even generalize to like bigger scenes at all. Um, and plus, if you do this, you get translation equivariance for free. So this is a double win. And the same thing applies for history length, right? You, can, you know, like all these R and N models, um, you can apply those, but these generalize much, much poorer than like something like our model, which only uses like one step of history. So we deliberately don't use a recurrent model, even though that's something we have tried in the past, uh, because generalization is much worse for them. And finally, locality. Um, this is a little bit similar to the previous point, and that's something graph nets often just give you for free. Uh, that's because by sharing the node and edge networks between particles, we kind of effectively learning the laws of physics in a small local neighborhood. So it means you have to observe much less variation in training to achieve generalization to very different systems. Because you can kind of see like in these different systems, locally, they might look very similar. So you can transfer a lot of more knowledge compared to if you're learning the whole scene at once. All right, so finally, uh, we're gonna look at some limitations and areas of future research. So currently, we only train um, our remeshing model on the input mesh distribution, which I already mentioned. And this is not optimal, right? And one obvious and also exciting addition would be to instead optimize the meshing for performance on like prediction accuracy or some other downstream tasks you might care about. And you can use this adaptivity then to smartly downsample like very large scientific data and, and all this good stuff. Um, and second, as I mentioned, training noise is kind of one of the key elements to stable rollouts. It's very effective, but we don't actually fully understand exactly what's happening there. It's a parameter that we just need to tune. And I think there's probably something more fundamental behind that. And I think understanding better what exactly the effect of it is may give us the tools to do the same thing with a more like elegant and effective approach. This is something we're like interested in studying more. And it's also would be cool to think about how we can actually use these models now that we have them, right? Beyond prediction. Uh, because, I mean, now you have a differential model. You might want to do things like design optimization um, or like use them in MBL settings or whatever, right? And of course, learned simulators would be even more useful if you could actually learn not only from simulation, but from real data. So then you could ca capture things for which you don't have a good classical simulator, right? And this comes with a lot of challenges, but I think ultimately that would be like really direction to push these, uh, push, this, push this research in. Um, and yeah, so in conclusion, uh, I hope that I convinced everyone that both meshes and graph nets are awesome and together they can bring us a lot of desirable properties to learn simulation. And yeah, we feel this is a very exciting area to work in and there's a lot of open questions and there's no shortages of like hard problems to tackle. 
Um, and yeah, we specifically are interested in looking forward to more research and adaptivity. And we're also curious how far we can scale these models up just in sheer scale, right? Like, um, and if you actually have a, a problem that you really care about, and I think this is a really hard challenge problem um, that is hard to solve with classical methods or like has some not so nice properties, like um, talk to us. We're really interested in thinking about like where like ultimately this kind of research can be pushed towards. And so, yeah, in the, the bottom corner, I have the contact details. If you want to like, I don't know, if you're interested in stuff, feel free to shoot me an email. There's also the paper and the video side with all uh, the examples. I'll show you. All right, that's it for uh, me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting questions. Uh, we have quite a few uh, questions from the audience. And I have quite a few questions myself. <laughs> sure. so, yeah, so let's start with an audience question. Last time you, you, you were ending up, ended the presentation talking about scaling up in size. Uh, um, question regarding, uh, is there any reason not to use it for molecular simulation? So scaling mm. down in physical size. Yeah. I see, yeah. Um, I mean, potentially, right? So I, I don't know super much about molecular simulations. Um, they're, they're slightly different in that they're like inherently discrete, right? And so like, I mean, graph nets are being used for that. There's a lot of success already. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the specific innovations we had here would probably apply less, like all the adaptivity stuff it doesn't really work if you don't have a continuous domain, for example, right? Correct. But I think similar methods can apply. And I think there are a bunch of papers that are doing similar stuff using graph nets on molecular simulations. I don't know like the unique challenges there. I mean, I, I know that probably like time scales are like a little bit insane there, right? So like if you have to like, run at like nanosecond tile scales for like a long time. I mean, then like rollout computations become like really inefficient or whatever. Um, but I mean, I think like, I don't know, if you have specific specific questions about like, what kind of properties do you need there? Um, I would be really interested in, in like hearing that. Um, like I said, I don't necessarily know what the challenges are there. Uh, thanks. And, and a question that you pointed out to uh, is, is about, you know, how to deal with these long range interactions or where the model fails, right? What, what possible solutions uh, mm. basically, or, or have other people tried some solutions to, to this problem? Yeah, um, I mean, that's like a few different things you can do about that, right? So one obvious thing is like, I mean, kind of doing the same thing that like classical simulators do, which is, um, if you're, if the problem is like propagation of information, you can like accelerate that by things like hierarchies, right? So like what multi-crit methods do in like uh, in classical simulators, you could also do, right? So you could have your, your graph net, which is kind of like uh, your finest scale. And then you can have a f like one or two or multiple layers on top of that, right? Which uh, you propagate information up and do a bunch of message parsing there, propagate it down again, right? There is some papers doing that. It's Bit more specific. There's a paper I, I, have, I forget what it's called from. Um, I think it's from from MIT Josh Tenenbaum's group, uh, which does that for like kind of these more um, uh, everyday physics types of predictions. So what, what they do is, for example, like they represent like rigid objects as a bunch of particles, and then have like a hierarchy that tells us like, wait, this you know this is one object, right? So you it's like very easy to exchange information between it, and so we can have these rigidity constraints. Uh, computed very easily, right? So you kind of like inject information to the hierarchy, inject information on like scene structure in there, right? But you don't necessarily have to even do that. Really, you can just like do that. You can just like do mesh coarsening basically on these flag examples or whatever. You can just like have two levels of coarse meshes and then just like do, um, yeah, uh, propagate information up by pooling right. and then like propagation of information down right. again. Right. Um, right. Yeah, so this is one thing. There's also a lot of other stuff. I mean, there's like uh, spectral methods on graphs, uh, which is also like there's a bunch of papers coming out now. I don't think anyone has looked at that in the in for like simulation, but I mean, you can probably do similar things. Like, but I think like ultimately the idea is really just doing the same thing you do in classical simulators uh, by using like structures that like are like either faster, like kind of skip connections between your nodes. Or like kind of features that operate in a different space, like I mean, Fourier modes or whatever, to use to propagate information faster. Right. 
So, so there was a question about asking about more detail about the training noise. So how do you inject uh, training noise? Right, yeah. So um, if you're interested in, in all the gory details, actually this the paper has an appendix which like details that and like <laughs> has like walks you through like one of these examples. And there's like a bunch of uh, weird considerations there. But like basically the idea is really just um, we have like a Gaussian noise distribution which we add to our inputs, right? So what that does is like it prepares the networks like saying like okay we, we you will see noise corrupt the distributions at some point during the rollout right and this is particularly relevant because there's a certain type of state you will never see in your training data so if you think about incompressible fluids you will never like see compressibility right so you uh, will never like see a source or a sink but like by accumulation of error you will eventually create one so you need to like prepare the network for like looking at that and saying like, okay, that can't be right. I need to correct for that. And this is one of the things that noise does. And similarly for the flag, for example, again, like one common failure mode is that like, you just like, you kind of lose the rest state information. It's like things just elongates and just like, you lose kind of like your, uh, your rest state. And then this is again, like, because there's, you never see these violations of some physical constraints and training and noise is like one easy and cheap way to produce that. And then, um, so on the more like practical side, how you do it, it's like, yes, you corrupt your input. And then like there's several options of what you can do with that on the loss side. So the easiest thing is you say like, you correct for the noise. So that means you have the, your target is still the same thing. So you, you like move this node a little bit like up, for example, but you still predict like the, the ground truth output. So that kind of then model learns to correct for that. And that's very good to like for, for things like incompressible flow or whatever, right? Because it learns to correct this in physical states. The other thing is like if you you can also like say like, well, really you want to predict a target that also has a noise effect, right? Like if you move this particle up, it should kind of like uh, represent the fact that this particle is now like up here, right? So it should give you a physical state, but like with this particle shifted. And these kind of all of these options are detailed in, in the appendix. Yeah, uh, perfect. Um, another question we have is: uh, Have these uh, ha has the output of these simulations uh, be fed uh, to um, you know an ing traditional engineering solver? For example, um, you could for the airflow example, you could uh, run a simulation to get the flow field and pressure field around the, the airflow, and then use that as initial conditions to an engineering simulation which can then converge a lot faster because it's already very close to to the correct to to a solution yeah i mean you haven't tried that uh i mean i think part of that is because i mean <laughs> we're like an ai lab so we don't have that much like uh knowledge on this whole things and the interfacing the solver is always a bit icky but i think it's 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 the right idea right because like i mean like one way you can use these simulations particularly because they are faster than the ground truth simulator often is to guess give it like a good guess and then like in order to really verify your results like once you have something you like you yeah you use this initial guess right or i mean you can even go further than that you can say like oh well maybe we use that as a precondition right just to solve your um, equations faster and things like that and i think this is, there's a lot of good stuff there you can do and specifically if i mean these methods are meant as a general kind of purpose thing but in many cases you if, if you want to just like for one specific application make it work better um i mean you can actually do that right you can just like combine that with an existing solver um maybe not learn everything just like learn some things and i feel like you will this way you'll get much much better performance and there's some nice papers on that um there's a new one by Dimitri Kochkov from uh, Google Accelerated Science. I uh, forget the paper title, but it just came out. This is a really interesting paper that does exactly that on, uh, on turbulent flows, where they actually, I mean, they kind of predict correction fields, but then feed it back into like an actual solver to, for example, like, like a, a do the pressure, pressure correction and get like, I mean, you show that they really get like, uh, Highly accurate results, but still uh, faster than than ground truth. All right. So, so uh, regarding speed, um, how fast really is this simulation? Is it comparable to what's used in computer graphics? For example, can can it be used in games? Yeah, I mean, so these things are faster than ground truth, but 
this is because the ground truth is really slow, right? <laughs> it's not that the masses are super fast. Um, and there's reasons for the, why they are faster, um, because, I mean, they can take larger time steps than a ground truth solver. And the, I mean, these um, ground truth solvers we have are generally like, for a lot of reasons, not meant to run on GPUs, with very few exceptions, versus like these like neural architectures are like really meant to like scale well on like uh, TPUs, GPUs, and all of that stuff, right? But on the other hand, if you compare to the methods that are used in graphics, already a lot of these shortcuts that like we take have already been taken, right? So for example, they're generally like highly optimized for like uh, GPUs or whatever, right? They generally like don't care as much about accuracy, so like they already like take might take some shortcuts there, right? And it's not inconceivable you can use these methods for something similar, especially if you're talking about like a bit more like, I mean, not like hardcore, like real time, but like uh, interactive rates, you can probably run that. It's more like this whole ecosystem isn't really meant for that, right? Like, um, I mean, just evaluating TensorFlow models isn't meant to like work at real, uh, real time frame rates. Um, there's a lot of things you might find to be the bottleneck, which is really nothing, doesn't really have much to do with the, with the method itself, right? So I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, you can might make that work somehow, but like, it's probably not that trivial. I think it's like the strengths are more like to um, accelerate like these kind of bigger engineering and scientific simulations and real time might be a bit harder to make work for, yeah, engineering reasons. So, so in conclusion is like, uh, do you think that the traditional methods are, 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 uh, are slower just because they don't, um, they don't utilize the hardware as well as they can, or the methods themselves are slower? I mean, I think it's both, right? So like, yeah, hardware utilization is a thing. I mean, if you look at a lot of these codes, um, I mean, A, they are often very old and complex. I mean, <laughs> a lot of the scientific community runs on Fortran code from like 20 years ago. But, right. um, but also, I mean, there's fundamental reasons why like often you don't have, say, GPU versions of this, right? So like if you have a very easy problem, say like solving a Poisson problem on like uh, um, on like I don't know grid or something, right? With periodic boundary conditions, there's like I mean you can use FFT solvers, you can do multi grid stuff scales really well, right? You can like parallelize that well. There's no problem. The problem is once you go to these complex domains like things like on on, on weird meshes with like have right. complicated boundary conditions, a lot of these uh, nice properties break down, right? multi grid methods don't scale as much anymore, right? right? They're very complicated to implement and to get right. Uh, they're not really meant to scale very well on these like accelerator hardware, and but also like I mean the speed ups you get is like less and less and less, right? And I mean there is really like by learning these interactions. Uh, with like um, operations that are really meant for like uh, accelerated hardware, we can actually skip a lot. And the other thing is, like I mentioned before, you can also like um, you, you get, the reason we can actually predict larger time scales and don't have to take that many like sub steps is kind of a little bit similar, right? So like the model learns to recognize some sort of pattern. Like even while we're doing like local computations, we don't really need to do like particle particle interactions, right? You can like look at like a cluster of particle and the other cluster of particle and like see like how do those interact, right? And this is kind of like the, the power of learning. Like you could never like write down an exact model how that works, right? But this is something you can learn. And this is something like that lets you kind of break all of these classical constraints, like CFL condition, whatever, right? None of that applies here, right? Because the fundamental math is different and the model learns to kind of compensate for a lot of that. Yeah, interesting. So uh, another uh, question asked was, in, instead of having, let's say, noisy input, right? What if you're trying to predict, you know, noisy output uh, or noisy uh, or unobserved output, partially unobserved output? Um, did you, have you used these methods uh, in that situation? I'm not sure what that exactly uh, First, because I mean, if you have, I mean, unobserved outputs, you need, still need a target, right? Because these are like supervised predictions. So, like, what would the target then be? So, I think like one other thing to com contrast to like using this noise thing, what people generally do is something like, well, you can use the model to make predictions, and the predictions then have errors, right? And this is kind of like that what you, what you can train on, right? So then, like, you uh, you run your model forward, say like, okay, here's my prediction, slightly off, and then you train on that data, right? either by like 
taking your sol real ground truth solvers again and like running on that and comparing, or by saying, oh, I just want to correct for my error. So I still use the same target, right? And this is something like you kind of like do the same thing as this noise trick, except like the noise distribution is really what your model error is, which sounds really nice in theory, except it doesn't work that well in practice. And I mean, some papers do that with some success. But the reason I think it's like a bit hard to actually do that is because really you need to do that very far in the future to get the, the benefits of it, right? Doing one step of the model rollout doesn't really give you the error distribution at which like you kind of your model explodes. Maybe like doing a hundred steps does, right? So really you kind of, this is the type of error distribution you're interested in. So in order to do that, you would need to like do a hundred rollouts, which then is kind of a bit complicated to do in practice. And like, if you uh, run that in your training pipeline, it might be too slow and your memory explodes and all of that stuff, right? So you can make this work, but we, we're kind of actually happy that we often don't need to because this noise trick is like generally good enough to get it around that. So and I don't know, like if there's many cl more clarifications to like what the uh, training on this like different output thing is actually about, I would be interested to hear that, but I right. guess I don't really understand what it's going on. Yes. So, so again, reminder, you know, if, if anyone has any specific uh, questions, you can always uh, contact uh, to, uh, Tobias and yeah. Gina, that's listed. Another interesting thing that you mentioned was, um, you know, uh, because this ma model is differentiable, so possibly you can do it for design. So how would you use this? How, what does that mean? So how would you use it, let's say, to design uh, let's say an airflow airfoil that gives you a specific, you know, uh, uh, flow field or pressure field or uh, you know, drag coefficient, lift coefficient, and, and so on. Uh, yeah. How, how does one go about doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not something I have tried yet, so I don't know all the gory details. But I think like that. Why I think that like works really well is because if you this model can give you gradients, right? So what you can do is you can plug this model into like some sort of optimizer, right? So you have like a goal. The goal is say to like optimize, like um, minimize drag or like optimize lift or something like that, right? And then you have like inputs that you can change, which is like something that determines the shape of an airfoil or something else, right? And like traditionally what you would do is like either you run like a gradient free optimizer, uh, which is kind of very efficient, inefficient. It takes a lot of more rollouts to estimate these gradients in order to like optimize this kind of loss. Um, or you estimate gradients, right? Which is like something like uh, find a difference, right? Like you run your model twice and you take the difference. But this is also like, it's often a very noisy estimate. It's not very good. And like if you have a solver that gives you gradients, which some classical solvers actually do, right? Like they have there's a joint method solvers, which especially in like uh, aerodynamics, which give you that, right? And this is they are exactly used for this purpose often, right? But like our model also does give you gradients, right? So you can actually use these things in such an optimization loop to um, kind of give you like a, I don't know to be able to optimize for certain design parameters, right? And one other kind of non-obvious insight I think that might make this work really well is the way that the gradients are shaped, right? Um, even if you have a real simulator that gives you like gradients, often learned gradients are better for optimization. And <laughs> it's a bit like, I don't know what the actual science is. And I think there's probably some theory behind this. But um, I, I know that like some other people are trying this for rendering specifically, right? So. Um, Differentiable renderers, if you like implement that like uh, with perfect gradients, are harder to optimize than like a learned model of the same thing. Because I mean, gradients like already have to be like optimal for training in order to give you good predictions here. So they are also often something that leads you faster to a minimum and are often something that like lets you jump like stupid local minimum. Um, and again, like uh, this is a little bit hand wavy, but I, I think there might be something there which uh, we don't fully understand yet. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I have to read more uh, about that. Um, uh, so I see our time is almost over. I'd, I'd like to thank you for this uh, fantastic presentation. I really loved it. Also, thanks uh, to the audience who also provided uh, a lot of questions. Um, uh, to see more content like this, please visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. And uh, also make sure to subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel and explain to get notified about the live sessions and other free content uh, we published. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.